Hello again, everyone, and welcome. This is Jeff Klapes, the traveling librarian from the reference department at BB Library with some more armchair travel for you so you can see the world without leaving your home. WCAT here in Wakefield has generously partnered with us at BB Library to help us continue to bring our program to you however we can. And I'm pleased to have you join me today for a tour of the historic and cosmopolitan city of Istanbul in Turkey. As well as on WCAT, you'll be able to find this and other um, travel programs and other library programs on the library's YouTube channel. We hope you'll visit us there. And for more armchair travel photography, I hope you will follow me on Instagram, where you'll find um, my photography from all over the world. And I eventually hope you'll be able to join me again back at the library um, to tour other interesting destinations as well. But let's get started with a quick thumbnail sketch of Turkey. Turkey um, as a country has 75 million people. It is overwhelmingly Muslim, about 98% or so, and most of those are Sunni Muslims. Istanbul, or Istanbul in Turkish, um, is an enormous city. It's got about 14 million people, and it is the fifth largest city in the world by the city proper, as opposed to its metropolitan area. It was founded originally in the 7th century BC as Byzantium, and then in the 4th century AD, um, it was changed to Constantinople when the Emperor Constantine made it the Eastern capital of the Roman Empire. Um, the next big event was in 1453, when the Turks conquered it. Um, and eventually, at the fall of the Ottoman Empire um, in the early 20th century, that brought independence in the year 1922 after World War I was over under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Ankara is the political capital of the country, but Istanbul is still um, by far the driving force um, economically um, and for tourists and in terms of sheer um, power in the country. It's on the Bosphorus. Um, in between the Sea of Marmara down on the south and the Black Sea on the north. And as a result, it straddles Europe and Asia, and it has long been considered um, a country that is a mix of East and West, and that's um, somewhat of a, a trite expression for tourist brochures, but it is still quite true, and I think you'll see that as we wander around the city today. The Golden Horn, which is the little inlet that goes up um, to the upper left off of um, the Bosphorus, separates the old and new cities. Most of the historic sites in the city that would be of interest to tourists are in the old city, um, the Sultan Ahmet district, which is the central part right in the, the bottom center of this image. And here's an uh, aerial satellite view of that area. Um, we're going to visit most of the major sites in this localized section. And just to start off, off, here are a few scenes, street scenes from around the city, um, which is a particularly exciting place to wander at night. And here I am enjoying our extremely elaborate hotel lobby and the street our hotel was on had a spectacular view of Hagia Sophia, which we're going to visit now. Hagia Sophia was built by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian in the year 537, and it served as a Greek Orthodox church until 1453 when the Turks, um, the Ottomans conquered the city under Mehmet the Conqueror, who it's worth pointing out was only 21 years old when he did that. Um, from then on, uh, up until the 1930s, um, the building was used as a mosque under the Turks, um, the Ottomans, and um, under Ataturk, when Turkey became a modern nation, it was converted into a museum. So it is now neither a church nor a mosque um, and is a secular museum. It's probably the single most important Byzantine building anywhere in the world. The interior Christian's designs were covered over um, and minarets were added to the building. Here, um, a large number of tourists um, are, seem far more interested in the cat um, <laughs> sitting in the front lobby rather than the spectacular architecture around them. Here 
Here are several images just of the interior to show you just how incredibly elaborate um, the domes and the mosaics are. There's extensive um, Ottoman style tile work and carvings and both real and faux marble decorations. You can see in this image that there was scaffolding. They are, um, there have been uh, long time um, restoration work going on on this uh, monument for many years. And it is probably, if, if you were only in Istanbul for a very brief visit, it is the one thing that you should absolutely not miss. It's an architectural highlight um, throughout the entire world. The mosaic that you can see on the wall in this image um, is called the Theisis mosaic from the year 1261. And it commemorates an interesting time in the history of this building. Um, there was a brief period when it was um, uh, changed from the Orthodox faith to the Roman Catholic faith, and just for a decade or two. And when it was turned back into an Orthodox church, this mosaic, which shows the Virgin Mary, um, St. John the Baptist, and then Christ in the center, um, was installed to commemorate that event. Unfortunately, it's in very bad condition, but it is still one of the most beautiful mosaics from the Byzantine period. Here are some views looking out, um, both inside and out from the second floor where you get um, to look down and up at the minarets. On the south side of the building, there are the tombs um, in separate buildings of five of the important historic sultans of the Ottoman Empire. And you can um, visit each one. Here you can see some very typical royal tombs, um, green being the color of, symbolic color of Islam um, is prominent, um, as well as turbans which are used um, on each of the um, sepulchers. Here you can see there is an entire family. And the decorations here are, um, while not as sumptuous as the um, main Hagia Sophia building, are still quite elaborate and beautiful to look at. Um, interestingly, in this photograph, you can see two gentlemen who have the entirely prosaic task of vacuuming the sultans um, to keep them tidy. Across the way, um, facing on either side of uh, a beautiful park in the center of the city is the Blue Mosque, which we will visit in a little bit. These two imp uh, impressive and historic buildings face one another across this um, very beautiful open park area. And it's really the, it's the spiritual and the um, historic part of the city. Looking across the Golden Horn, we're going to visit that area in a little bit. I should go back to this other photo just for a moment to point out um, the wide variety of um, different types of people that you will see in Istanbul. Turkey is, of course, uh, a Muslim country. However, um, Istanbul in particular, being such a very modern cosmopolitan city, sees a very wide variety of um, different expressions of religion and culture. Uh, in this photograph, you can see someone who is uh, a woman who is um, completely covered head to toe, um, while at the same time eating an ice cream cone. Um, her husband and child, um, just uh, to the right, are dressed completely differently. You will find both men and women throughout the city dressed in um, all kinds of different styles of clothing, some very Western and modern, um, some very traditional, and everything in between. Um, being a very touristy city, you will find um, tourists from all over the world um, and a huge amount of commerce going on. 
Um, if you need a magic lamp, you can find an entire factory outlet full of them. We will visit the Grand Bazaar shortly where you can see even more. The street life in Istanbul is just incredible. Um, it's vibrant, it's chaotic. Um, you certainly would never want to drive a car in the city. Most of what um, a tourist would want to see is readily um, accessible um, by walking or by taking a short ferry or um, tram ride across the city. Here is one of the um, deceptively important uh, parts of the city. This is what was originally known as the Sublime Port um, back when France um, was still a major power in, in European diplomacy and French was the language of most uh, diplomacy uh, in the 19th century, certainly. This was the gate um, that was the entrance to the Ottoman government under Suleiman the Magnificent going back as, as far as the 16th century and continuing right up until the fall of the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century. Um, the government um, became referred to um, as the sublime port, la porte sublime, um, was frequently used just as uh, a short way of referring to the Ottoman government as a whole in much the same way that we talk about the White House um, as um, a sort of abbreviation for the U.S. presidency. Um, nowadays, this um, particular location is um, where the offices of the governor of Istanbul, the city, um, are located, and it's not actually open to the public. Here's some typical Ottoman architecture. Um, and one thing that you might easily miss if you didn't know it existed um, is the Basilica Cistern, which is a fascinating um, place to visit underground. Um, and many people walk right by it without even being aware that it's there under um, one of the most visited parts of the city. The cistern was built by Justinian along with Hagia Sophia at about the same time. And it's the largest of what were at the time hundreds of such cisterns around the city to store water um, for uh, a water supply for the population. This particular one, which is now a tourist attraction, holds um, up to 2.8 million cubic feet of water. And now um, it is, it's such a tourist attraction that you can actually dress up as a sultan and get your photograph taken. Um, but more importantly, you can just stroll around the um, elevated walkways that they have. There is still a few feet of water um, in the bottom of the, the cistern, um, and you can walk around the atmospheric columns. Um, in a number of places, there are some unusual sites. These are some Medusa heads that were used as the bases of columns. Uh, to support the structure. The heads were originally part of Roman buildings um, in the area. And it's incredible to think that this would once have been completely filled from floor to ceiling with millions of cubic feet of water to supply the city. Um, not far from the entrance to the cistern is this 3,500 year old obelisk that comes from Karnak in Egypt from uh, the fourth century BC. And it stands in a long plaza, um, this very long um, skinny plaza that almost looks like it would have been used for chariot racing. Um, well, it actually was. It used to be a hippodrome during the Roman era. And the, although that structure has long since disappeared, um, the shape is still there and it's been paved into a, a major public plaza. People come to visit, chat, eat. And the neighborhood right around is actually quite enjoyable to walk around. Many of the um, traditional Ottoman style architecture, both in wood and in stone, is visible. And a number of these buildings that have been um, fixed up are used as bed and breakfasts um, and guest houses that are a great place to stay, um, not just for their price and their comfort, but because they're very conveniently located to a lot of the things that you might wanna see. Um, it's uh, only a few blocks down to the Bosphorus where you can watch the world go by in between the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea. 
Um, I thought this, uh, this is a view looking across to the Asian side of the Bosphorus um, and the industrial and shipping area. Um, I thought this was an um, attractive art installation until I realized it was basically just target practice for a bunch of guys who were using rifles to shoot balloons uh, to pass the time. Um, locals still do fishing here while oil tankers from Russia and Ukraine are going by. But back up on the hill, you will see um, the Blue Mosque, which is another one of the major places to visit. This was officially um, known as the Sultan Ahmet Mosque, for, uh, named after its builder, who constructed it in the early 1600s. It has six minarets, which was considered quite improper since that's the number of minarets that the mosque at Mecca, um, the holy city had. Um, so the solution that the Sultan came up with was to simply add a seventh minaret to the mosque in Mecca. It's known as the Blue Mosque, even though the exterior is mostly just gray stone, um, because the interior is um, blue from floor to ceiling. Um, there are 20,000 tiles, ceramic tiles, on the interior from nearby Iznik, which um, is a little further south of Istanbul, south and east. The mosque was designed by a protege of the great architect Sinan, um, who will um, come across a little bit later. And um, if you're curious um, about visiting mosques, Turkey is one of many um, places where you are, as a non-Muslim, allowed to visit um, mosques. Um, some Muslim countries do not permit this. It is entirely up to the local decision um, and the religious traditions in those areas what they, what they permit. But Istanbul, particularly because Turkey is a bit more open than some other Muslim countries, and also because it's such a tourist destination, um, they do allow non-Muslims to enter mosques provided that you um, don't go in during uh, prayer services. And also you do have to be appropriately um, discreetly dressed. Um, women do have to wear headscarves, which they make available for you, and you would um, have to take off your shoes. But other than that, you are welcome to, to go in and visit. Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque each can hold tens of thousands of worshipers at a single time. Um, the Blue Mosque in particular is just mind-boggling when you look at the incredibly extensive um, ceramic tiles. On a, more <laughs> on a more humorous level, this is where you can, at the entrance to the mosque, where you can uh, drop off your shoes and pick up a headscarf if you need one. Um, this sounds almost like um, an Italian comedian made the sign, please do not leave a here your plastic bags. These are just more street scenes around Istanbul. Um, I love just walking the streets of Istanbul. This is a restaurant that had a great view of a, a busy intersection. Um, there's constant comings and goings. Um, and every block there is some incredibly important historic monument to look at. This is very close to the Grand Bazaar, which we'll um, visit a little bit later. This is a mosque that's just outside it that most people would never bother to go in because it's not one of the top um, sights to see, but still it's just incredible when you go inside. This is actually a view from our hotel room where you can see one of the minarets of Hagia Sophia off in the distance. Um, the other big no-miss attraction, which is just maybe a 10 or 15 minute walk from the sites we've seen so far, is the Topkapi Palace, which was used for 400 years between the 15th and the 19th centuries. Um, it's, um, it was the center of Ottoman power um, and the Sultan's power for that entire time period. This is the Gate of Salutation, which is the entrance to the second courtyard. Here's a floor plan just to give you a rough idea of how it's organized. There are actually four progressively more um, private courtyards as you get further into the palace. This is the Imperial Council of the Sultan. Um, that tower that you can see in the back is called the Divan Tower, where the Sultan's council would meet. 
it's an enormous complex and you could easily spend half a day or more exploring all the different aspects of it. And there are superb museums um, that are part of the complex. This is the 16th century audience chamber where the Sultan would grant audiences to um, both people from the Ottoman Empire um, in Istanbul and also travelers visiting from around the world. There was a library with manuscripts built in a sort of neoclassical style. Fountains, gardens, and because of its location at the tip of the peninsula, there are superb views um, from the terraces over the, um, over the Bosphorus where you can see ferries um, and shipping. Um, this is um, one of the museum pavilions that um, has the um, royal collections in it and has really amazing views across the city. This small pavilion um, was actually used um, for the Sultan's family to get cool. Um, they ate ice cream, um, as anyone living in a hot climate should do now and then, particularly if you're a Sultan. There are elaborate pavilions all over and much like the mosques that we've seen, the highly elaborate decoration in Islamic Ottoman style is, is just um, extravagant and, and mind boggling. This is a view up to the, um, across the Golden Horn. We'll visit that area in a little bit. And here's a view of the Galata Tower, which we'll get up close to a little bit later. Um, that's probably the, the main landmark that you can see across the Golden Horn on the north side of the city. The highlight of any visit to the Tafkapi Palace is the harem. And um, in addition to all of the other museums, um, you can visit the harem separately. Um, the kitchens, which you can see here, each one of those um, little pyramids with a chimney coming out the top is a gigantic kitchen. And they've recently redone the museums there uh, to do really great displays of life during uh, the Sultan's rule uh, to see how a gigantic palace like this would have been run behind the scenes. And this is looking up at uh, one of the chimneys. There's also areas set aside for the Janissaries who were the elite guards, many of whom had been kidnapped from uh, other countries um, and trained to serve the Sultan. But as I said, it's the harem that is the most um, fascinating part to visit. Um, it was the most private part of the palace. It had literally hundreds of rooms. This is a floor plan of just one level. Um, this whole complex was limited only to the Sultan and his wives and concubines. Um, the Valid Sultan, who was the mother of the Sultan um, and various princes and of course eunuchs. You can explore um, all uh, scores and scores of rooms in the harem. Um, it's definitely um, a part of the palace that you should not miss. This is the imperial hall that has the Sultan's throne in it. This is called the courtyard of the favorites. with more fantastic um, decorations, including um, not just tile work, but painting. Um, some parts of this palace were um, designed during the 18th and 19th centuries when uh, the Ottoman Empire was very consciously trying to imitate the Western European powers like uh, France in particular, but also Austria, Hungary, Germany and so forth. So you'll see some parts of the palace that seem almost to have a more um, fancy Western European look to them. And that was quite deliberate. Um, they were trying to 
keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. This is an important chamber known as the um, the circumcision chamber. Um, even today, um, young Muslim men are circumcised. It is a religious tradition and was certainly the case for young princes. Um, unlike in other cultures, um, in Islam, um, in Turkey, young men are circumcised as teenagers, not as infants. So it's a very different kind of experience. Here are some more of the terraces and views across. This is the Sultan Ahmet um, mosque that we will see in a little bit. Um, another major site to see in the historic city is the Grand Bazaar. Here's the entrance to it. Construction on the Grand Bazaar started in the 15th century. Um, it is still today one of the largest covered markets anywhere in the world, and it's certainly one of the oldest. Um, it's one of the most popular things to visit in Istanbul. This is the mosque just outside of it. Um, once you get in, um, you can easily get lost, um, and that's part of the fun. There are over 60 streets and over 3,000 shops inside. Um, in 2014, which was the most recent date that I could find um, a statistic for, it had um, over 90 million visitors. Uh, many of those are tourists and many of them are actually local um, Turks who um, do their shopping there as well. Um, there are household goods, tourist goods, um, food, um, rugs, anything that you could possibly imagine. Tourism in Turkey has certainly changed recently, um, not just this year because of the coronavirus, but also because of Turkey's um, political changes in recent years under um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the um, autocratic ruler who has definitely shifted Turkey more um, in a very conservative direction. It's still, for tourists, a perfectly safe place to visit, but um, politically Turkey is in a very different place than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and it remains to be seen what happens in the future. Um, if Erdogan continues to rule. Um, this is a, um, a spice section of the market. You'll notice that there's a very hot um, chili spice in the very center of the front that says chili for a mother-in-law. <laughs> um, here are some of the streets just around that part of town. It's um, one of my favorite aspects of Istanbul is just enjoying the local street life and watching um, ordinary Istanbuli uh, people going about their daily life. If you need Turkish lamps, um, there are thousands to choose from. Um, this um, was a kebab shop that apparently, as far as I can tell, is the most popular one in the city because there was a half an hour line um, all the way around the block. Because the streets are very narrow and traffic is ridiculous, um, the local um, package deliverers tend to use more old fashioned methods. Um, moving a little further west, this is the largest mosque in the city, the Suleimani Mosque. And it's an imperial mosque, again, built for the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent by Sinan the architect, who was probably the most uh, famous Ottoman uh, empire architect um, who lived during the 16th century. This particular mosque was built in the 1550s. It's an enormous complex, but it's uh, sited very high up on the hill and gives you a view across the Golden Horn. It's been damaged over the centuries by both fire and earthquakes. So the current design, um, because it's changed over the centuries, has lost a little bit of some of the elaborate decoration of the original, but it's still very beautiful. This is the main courtyard. The interior, as you can see, is quite a bit plainer than the Blue Mosque or Hagia Sophia. And most of the decoration is painted rather than ceramic. These are benches where the faithful, before they enter the mosque, would wash their feet in a ritual um, bathing ceremony before entering to pray. 
Um, like some of the other mosques, there's also a number of royal tombs um, in the garden cemetery just outside that includes the tombs of Suleiman himself and his wife, Roxelana, um, who is, if you're ever interested in reading about this time period, she's a fascinating character um, in her own right. Here are some of the royal family tombs. And the cemetery itself is a very good example of a typical um, uh, Islamic cemetery with tombs in a uh, unique style that's completely different to anything that you would see in Western societies. Including many that have turbans on the top. Um, and if you head down the hill through the busy streets, you will come to another um, of the great bazaars. This one is not as big as the Grand Bazaar, um, but it's well worth visiting as well. This um, is right at the edge of the Golden Horn, and it's the Spice Bazaar. Um, it is part of a complex um, that also includes um, a mosque, which we'll see shortly, called the New Mosque, which um, is new only because it was built in the 17th century rather than the 16th. Um, and it has 85 shops selling mostly spices and sweets. Here you can see Turkish Delight or Lokum, which is made with starch and sugar, flavored with um, nuts, fruits, sesame, honey, rose water, and all kinds of other Middle Eastern ingredients, all kinds of spices. Perfumes. These are um, dried flowers for potpourri, nuts, dried fruits, peppers, olives, everything that you can imagine. And just across the, um, the plaza is the new mosque that I mentioned. So this is a 17th century mosque. with a huge um, pile of domes uh, packed one against each other. Back up towards the center of the city, um, those of you from a certain era might remember a film um, from 1978 called Midnight Express and The Pudding Shop, which has actually been in Istanbul for many, many decades. It opened in 1957 and for a long time, it was a popular counterculture meeting place for tourists and expats who were living there at the time in the 60s and 70s. Um, it became even more famous by being featured in the, um, the movie from 1978 called Midnight Express, which is, um, if you are interested in Turkish prisons, it's worth seeing. <laughs> um, and just some interesting and uh, somewhat humorous scenes of street life. You can have expert calligraphers um, do artwork for you, and it's even cheaper than beer. There was a bombing um, in the plaza um, right around where these photographs were taken um, that did kill a number of German tourists a few years ago, and that did um, major damage to um, Turkey and Istanbul in particular, um, the, the tourist trade there, it has bounced back a little. Um, but of course, this year um, with the pandemic, it will be interesting to see whether Istanbul manages to hold on to its um, place as a major tourist, tourist stop. One aspect that uh, it has going for it is that Turkish Airlines, which is a very well-regarded airline, um, is of course based in Istanbul and has extensive flights that, that most of which go through Istanbul. So for many people who are traveling, um, the city makes a good stopover for a few days on your way to somewhere else. Um, something that's also probably worth doing while you're there is to find a rooftop restaurant where you can eat and watch the sun go down. Um, this is Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque late in the afternoon. Um, 
from a terrace where you can start to see the lights come up over the city. And if you time it right, you will also hear the evening prayers, which are broadcast from the minarets over the entire city. And it's just an absolutely delightful experience that makes you feel like you're in a completely different culture because you are. As much as Istanbul is a blend of East and West, um, it still is very much an Eastern city in many ways. This is a view of the Topkapi Palace lit up at night. And the Galata Tower across the river. Um, Turkish food is great. Um, it's a, as you might expect, it's a mix of Mediterranean style cooking um, and also Middle Eastern cooking. So um, it's delicious. There's um, all kinds of meat and vegetarian options, wonderful street food. I have no idea what roasting shepherd is. Um, I just enjoyed the sign. This is the uh, downtown post office. And as we move down towards the Golden Horn, you get to see a little bit of some of the, the busy um, life um, right at the harbor front where a lot of boating activity goes on. Um, the mosque that you can see up on the hill is the Suleimani Mosque that we visited just a few minutes ago. Um, you absolutely must take a boat ride um, at some point on your visit to Istanbul, even if it's just to uh, cross um, on an ordinary um, commuter ferry across the river. There is a metro. Uh, it is the only transcontinental metro in the world. It goes under the river from Europe to Asia. So you can actually take the metro system to get from one place to another. Um, but it's well worth it to take a boat ride as well. There are tourist boat rides that will take you up the Bosphorus to the Black Sea. Um, but you don't have to spend a lot of money to take tourist trips, um, even just riding the ordinary um, commuter ferries that, uh, that all the locals take um, is just as enjoyable and gets you out on the river um, to see what is, after all, a maritime city. And for centuries, um, Istanbul has made its money and its place in the world by um, virtue of being in a prime physical location um, on the water. It's also a cruise ship destination, although um, given the coronavirus, it will be interesting to see what happens with the cruise industry in coming years. On the newer side of the city, you can see very different styles of architecture. Um, the, one of the bridges that crosses the river um, actually has the metro running across it, and that glass tube that you can see in the middle is actually the metro stop. And it's kind of unusual that they, they built the metro stop exactly in the middle of the river rather than at one end or another. So um, if you stop there, regardless of which side you're going to, you have to walk. The Galata Bridge, which is the main bridge across the Golden Horn, um, is a two-level bridge that was um, built with restaurants um, on the lower level and then traffic on top. Um, it's the fourth bridge that was built um, there over, over the, the over history. Um, the one that was most recently built was in 1912, but it burned in the early 1990s. There was a huge fire. Um, two years later, they reopened the bridge. And this is the old one um, that was simply floated down the river and it's been sitting there for the past 20 some odd years um, waiting for them to figure out what to do with it. Um, when the bridge was closed and burned, it was a major catastrophe because um, not only was it um, important because of all the restaurants and um, traffic that was actually on the bridge, but it was also an incredibly important thoroughfare that got people from one side of the Golden Horn to the other, and it bollocked up traffic for um, a couple of years while it was being rebuilt. A little further up the Golden Horn, um, this is something that if you have kids with you is a great thing to visit. 
Um, it's a museum of transportation that includes cars, boats, and the submarine that you can see there is actually a World War II American submarine. So if you're looking for things for kids to do if they get tired of mosques and palaces, um, it's a great uh, way to spend the afternoon. If you keep going up the Golden Horn, which most people don't bother to do, there's a really nice old neighborhood that's along what used to be the outer city walls, um, the old medieval city walls. Um, it's a mixture of very poor and old um, and also newly gentrified and renovated buildings. Very few tourists bother to go to this area. Here you can see um, the edge of what was the medieval city with the protective medieval walls. But the reason you would make a trip um, to this part of town is to visit the Cora Church. Um, this is what it would have looked like without scaffolding. This is not my photograph, um, because while we were there, it was under a many year period of uh, restoration, which I believe has finally now um, been completed. The original church was built outside the walls um, that's why it's called the Hora Church, which means village. Um, it, in Greek, it was built outside the walls of the original city. Um, the current building dates from the 11th century, and it has some of the world's best Byzantine mosaics and frescoes. Um, if you are interested in Byzantine art, it is a major site that any, um, any art student would want to visit. The main body of the church is completely covered in absolutely superb mosaics in excellent condition. And the side chapel um, has only frescoes, but they are also in extremely um, good condition. It was used as a mosque for a while um, and eventually was, um, like Hagia Sophia, was converted into a secular um, museum in 1958. So now it is neither a church nor a mosque, but um, a superb museum to the um, highest expression of Byzantine art, particularly mosaics. And even if it um, were under restoration, it still merits a visit because there is so much to see. Um, on a completely different <laughs> artistic um, style, this is the neighborhood that surrounds it. Um, the Turks do like their dish televisions, apparently. Here you can see the reconstructed Galata Bridge. Um, crossing the Golden Horn. You can walk across the top. There is both traffic, um, car traffic and um, pedestrian traffic across the top. And then the lower level is just one fish restaurant after another. Um, and you can walk down below and you can fish from both levels as well. In the newer part of the city, there's a synagogue. Here's the Galata Tower. This was actually not built by um, the Ottomans. It was built by the Genoese um, from Italy. It's more than 200 feet tall and is the landmark on that side of the river. Um, it was built in 1348 as a watchtower. And you can see a very um, different kind of atmosphere on this side of the city. This is the more modern part of the city. Um, it um, has a few historic sites, but it is um, a more vibrant, um, 20th century type of city. This is called Istiklal, um, Independence Street, and it's the main shopping street that runs through this whole part of the city, um, and it is almost completely pedestrianized, um, with the exception of the old-fashioned tram system that still operates. There's all kinds of um, great shops and restaurants and hotels along this area, and a lot of little side galleries like this um, to explore as well. If you follow it all the way to the end, you come to Taksim Square, which is unfortunately rather new and kind of ugly, um, but it is the political heart of the modern city. Um, we're looking at a monument um, of the Republic that was put up in 1928. Um, but if you ever follow news, um, that's happening in Turkey, 
um, whenever there is a big public demonstration, this is the square um, where people are likely to gather. Um, it's the main political heart of the city. And there are a number of parks and some international hotels that are around the area. Um, this is um, a much older um, type of 19th century architecture um, in this part of the city. This is the Para Palace Hotel. Um, it was opened in 1895 in the era of really wonderful grand hotels. And it was for um, many years the end of the Orient Express for Europeans who were doing a grand tour and traveling to Istanbul. Um, many people, famous people um, from Winston Churchill, Greta Garbo, Agatha Christie, anyone who's famous that you can imagine has probably stayed here at some point. Um, the closest I've gotten is to eat in the restaurant, which is very good. Um, it was the first building in Istanbul to have electricity um, and an electric elevator and hot running water. If you're interested, um, you don't have to stay there to go in and see the beautiful interiors. Um, and it's worth having tea in the, um, the tea room. Here's the elevator. Um, or lunch in the restaurant. Just to see what the interior is like. I can also recommend um, a book. Once the library reopens, we will be happy to get you a book called Midnight at the Para Palace, which is all about the uh, birth of modern Istanbul as a 20th century city. Um, and it has a fascinating social history of the time period when this hotel was a major social hub. Not far down um, the hill from that hotel is something completely different. This is the Galata Mevlevi Lodge, um, considerably older. It was built, in fact, 500 years earlier. Um, I'm sorry, 400 years earlier, in 1491. Um, this is a lodge for dervishes. Um, everyone has heard of whirling dervishes, but not very many people have had the opportunity to actually see them and understand what um, they're all about. This is the oldest of the six remaining dervish houses um, in Istanbul. Um, dervishes are Sufis, which is a sect of Islam, uh, a spiritual sect that was originally banned uh, officially um, for a long time um, and is now even today only really allowed to continue as a cultural exhibition rather than as a religious entity. Um, so even though the ban has, li has been lifted um, officially, very few of these lodges still remain. Um, but if you have a chance to go to an actual dervish lodge as opposed to seeing tourist dervishes um, who will dance in restaurants. Um, this, it, it, it's a very moving ceremony and you get to really understand much more about what it means. Um, here is a cemetery just outside the lodge. Um, but the interior is actually um, a religious space. Um, the ceremony involves prayer, music, and dance, and the whirling, which is what most people associate dervishes with, um, symbolizes unity with the universe um, and the cyclical nature of life and the universe, um, the planets, um, even now that we understand um, modern atomic theory, the idea that um, the basic units of matter operate in a circle. So the lengthy dancing, and if you've ever tried to twirl around even just for a couple of minutes, you will understand just how difficult it is. Um, these dancers train for a very long period of time, and the dances that they do can last 10 or 15 minutes at a time. Um, it's an incredibly um, enjoyable experience. Um, this is not dinner theater, this is actually a religious ceremony. Um, so it's a very worthwhile thing to go and learn um, and get a sense of respect for what this sect is all about.
Um, back in the rest of the city, here's a view of the um, Topkapi Palace from across the Golden Horn. Um, one of the little mosques that you might just stumble upon on a side street, one of the joys of the city. This is the Vilayet Mosque, which has this unusual striped look to it. Even the old train station has a fantastic sort of um, Islamic Moorish style to it, um, even though it was built in the Victorian era. Um, and it's also worth it, if you can, to take, as I mentioned, the ferry, take the ferry across the river, um, where you'll get to see lots of cruise ships and other things. Um, the Asian side of the Bosphorus is a neighborhood called Uskudar, and it's a little bit more off the beaten path um, and will give you more of a flavor of what it's like for just ordinary um, city residents who are going about their business. There are some beautiful mosques there, cemeteries. There's a great fish market and a waterfront promenade that um, is part of a park system that goes all the way up and down that stretch of um, the city that gives you fantastic views back over um, to the older historic part of the city. Um, the tower sort of lighthouse thing that you can see in this image is called the Maiden's Tower, um, sometimes also called Leander's Tower. And it was originally built in 1110, although much of what you see now is a version that was rebuilt in the 18th century. Um, there's a legend that says the emperor at one point um, put his daughter there to avoid the prophecy that he had um, heard of her being killed by a snake, um, a poisonous snake on her 18th birthday. Um, but she died anyway, because then when he went out to the small islet to celebrate her birthday, he brought a basket of fruit with him um, for her as a gift and the poisonous snake had gotten inside and she died anyway, fulfilling the prophecy. Um, the other major legend that is associated with this tower is that of Hero and Leander um, who died swimming um, the Hellespont um, in order to be with his beloved. Um, whether either of these stories are true is questionable, but they make great legends um, and it's still a beautiful spot. Um, now um, you can take a boat out. Um, there's a very trendy cafe on the, uh, the island where the tower is located and it's also a popular spot for weddings. The sunlight is hitting the Dolma Bache Palace um, across the river um, as well. Um, if you remember, I spoke earlier about how in um, the 19th century, um, the Ottoman Empire was very much trying to copy the, uh, the styles and uh, manners of the major Western European powers. And they tried to build their version of Versailles along the river to compete with the French. Um, this has, uh, the Dolma Bache Palace is almost a quarter of a mile long, you can see how long it is, and that room in the center where um, it's considerably higher is actually one of the largest ballrooms in all of Europe. Um, the palace has 285 rooms, and um, if you like that style of architecture, you can certainly um, spend at least a half a day visiting it. Um, the, that large room actually was full of Baccarat crystal chandeliers and even had a Baccarat staircase. Um, the Grand Hall was so large that if they had big events there, they actually had to start heating it several days ahead of time so that it would be ready in time. Um, the palace also has its own mosque and its own clock tower as part of the complex. Um, it's also known as the place where Kemal Ataturk, the um, founder of modern Turkey, um, died in 1938. Here is Istanbul University. And just across the street, um, it is Turkey after all. Um, you do need to see a genuine Turkish toilet, which um, although most um, buildings now have modern western style toilets there are a number of public facilities where you will find turkish toilets available um, not just in turkey but all over the world um, we're going to finish our tour of the city 
with a couple more mosques. This is the Shazad Mosque built for one of the um, princes of uh, Sultan Suleiman. And it has a painted interior. Um, not far from it is the aqueduct, um, the ancient aqueduct that brought water into the, into the city. And we're going to end um, passing through those neighborhoods to the far western part of the city, out near the walls, the old medieval walls. This is the Fatih Mosque, which is in a fairly conservative neighborhood, um, conservative Islam, that is. Um, and this huge complex was the first of the city's imperial mosques. So it's um, the oldest, and it was built in the late 1400s. Um, this whole neighborhood is very much off the beaten track for tourists, and it makes um, for an interesting place to visit because, again, it gives you more of a local feel um, that tourists don't necessarily see. And although this is a conservative neighborhood, again, you are welcome to go into the mosques um, observing the proper protocol and respect. There are also tombs, um, as most of the other mosques that we've seen um, in the gardens outside. And the neighborhood is just fun to wander around to see the wide um, disparity in um, street life and the way different people live around the world. So that's it for now. We'll end here. I want to thank you for traveling with me to one of my favorite cities in the world. And I hope you'll join me again at the library online or on WCAT TV for more travel destinations. And again, for more armchair travel photography, do follow me on Instagram. I hope to see you soon and keep exploring. Thank you.